I am a chef and a food policy guy,、uh, but I come from a, a whole family of teachers. My sister is a special ed teacher in Chicago. My father just retired after 25 years teaching fifth grade. My aunt and uncle were professors. My cousins all teach. Everybody in my family, basically teachers except for me. They taught me that the only way to get the right answers is to ask the right questions. So, what are the right questions when it comes to improving the educational outcomes for our children? So, there's obviously many important questions, but I think the following is a good place to start. What do we think the connection is between a child's growing mind to their growing body? What can we expect our kids to learn if their diets are full of sugar and empty of nutrients? What can they possibly learn if their bodies are literally going hungry? And with all the resources that we are pouring into schools, we should. Stop and ask ourselves: Are we really setting our kids up for success? Now, a few years ago, I was on—I was a judge on a cooking competition called Chopped. Four chefs compete with mystery ingredients to see、uh, who can cook the best dishes. Except for this episode, it was a very special one. Instead of four overzealous chefs trying to break into the limelight, something that I would know nothing about. These chefs were school chefs, you know the women that you used to call lunch ladies, but the ones that I insist we call school chefs. Now these women, God bless these women, they spent their day cooking for thousands of kids, breakfast and lunch, with only two dollars and sixty-eight cents per lunch, with only about a dollar of that actually going to the food. Now in this episode, the main course Mr. Ingredient was quinoa. Now I know it's been a long time since most of you have had a school lunch,、uh, and we've made a lot of progress on nutrition. But quinoa still is not a staple in most school cafeterias. <laughs> so this was a challenge. But the dish that I I will never forget was cooked by a woman named Cheryl Barbara. Cheryl was the nutrition director at high school in the community in Connecticut. She cooked this delicious pasta. It was amazing. It was a popper deli with Italian sausage. Kale, Parmesan cheese—it was delicious, like restaurant quality good. Except, she basically just threw in the quinoa, pretty much uncooked, into the dish. It was a strange choice, and it was super crunchy.、Um, so I, so I took on the TV sort of accusatory judge thing that you're supposed to do. Master, like why she did that? Cheryl responded, "Well, first I don't know what quinoa is, but." I do know that it's a Monday, and that in my school, at high school in the community, I always cook pasta. See, Cheryl explained that for many of her kids, there were no meals on the weekends, no meals on Saturday, no meals on Sunday either. So Cheryl wanted she cooked pasta because she wanted to make sure she cooked something that she knew. Her children would eat something that would stick to their ribs. She said, "Something that would fill them up." Cheryl talked that about by the time Monday came, her kids' hunger pains were so intense that they couldn't even begin to think about learning. Food was the only thing on their mind. The only thing. And unfortunately, the stats—they tell the same story. So let's put this into the context of a child, and we're going to focus on the most important meal of the day: breakfast. Meet Allison. She's 12 years old. She's smart as a whip, and she wants to be a physicist when she grows up. If Allison goes to a school that serves a nutritious breakfast to all of their kids, here's what's going to follow: her chances of getting a nutritious meal. One with fruit and milk, one in lower in sugar and salt, dramatically increase. Allison will have a lower rate of obesity than the average kid. She'll have to visit the nurse less. She'll have lower levels of anxiety and depression. She'll have better behavior. She'll have better attendance, and she'll show up on time more often 
Why? Well, because there's a good meal waiting for her at school. Overall, Allison is in much better health than the average school kid. So, what about that kid who doesn't have a nutritious breakfast waiting for him? Well, meet Tommy. He's also 12. He's a wonderful kid. He wants to be a doctor. By the time Tommy's in kindergarten, he's already underperforming in math. By the time he's in third grade, he's got lower math and reading scores. By the time he's 11, it's more likely that Tommy will have to have repeated a grade. Research shows that kids who do not have consistent nourishment, particularly at breakfast, have poor cognitive function overall. So, how widespread is this problem? Well, unfortunately, it's pervasive. Let me give you two stats that seem like they're on opposite ends of the of the issue, but are actually two sides of the same coin. On the one hand, one in six Americans. Are food insecure, including 16 million children, almost 20 percent, are food insecure. In this city alone, in New York City, 474,000 kids under the age of 18 face hunger every year. It's crazy. On the other hand, diet and nutrition is the number one cause of preventable death and disease in this country by far. And fully a third of the kids that we've been talking about tonight. On track to have diabetes in their lifetime. Now, what's hard to put together, but is true, is that many times these are the same children. So they fill up on, on the unhealthy and cheap calories that surround them in their communities, and that their families can afford. But then, by the end of the, end of the month, food stamps run out, or hours get cut at work, and they don't have the money to cover the basic costs of food. But we should be able to solve this problem, right? We know what the answers are. As part of my work at the White House, we instituted a, a program that, for all schools that had 40 percent more low-income kids, we could serve breakfast and lunch to every kid in that school for free. This program has been incredibly successful because it helped us overcome a very difficult barrier when it came to getting kids a nutritious breakfast. And that was the barrier of stigma. See, schools serve breakfast before class, before school, and it was only available for the poor kids. So everybody knew who was poor and who needed government help. Now, all kids, no matter how much or how little their parents make, they have a lot of pride. So what happened? Well, the schools that have implemented this program, they saw an increase in math and reading scores by 17.5 percent. 17.5 percent. And research shows that when kids have a consistent, nutritious breakfast, their chances of graduating increase by 20 percent. 20 percent. When we give our kids the nourishment they need, we give them the chance to thrive. Both in the classroom and beyond. Now, you don't have to trust me on this, but you should talk to Donna Martin. I love Donna Martin. Donna Martin is the school nutrition director at Burke County, in Waynesboro, Georgia. Burke County is one of the poorest districts in the fifth poorest state in the country, and about 100 percent of Donna's students、uh, live at or below the poverty line. A few years ago, Donna decided to get out ahead of the new standards that were coming, and overhaul her nutrition standards. She improved and added fruit and vegetables and whole grains. She served breakfast in the classroom to all of her kids, and she implemented a dinner program. Why? Well, many of her kids didn't have dinner when they went home. So how did they respond? Well, the kids they loved the food. They love the better nutrition, and they love not being hungry. But Donna's biggest supporter came from an unexpected place. His name was Eric Parker, and he was the head football coach for the Burke County Bears. Now, Coach Parker had coached mediocre teams for years. The Bears often ended in the middle of the pack, 
big disappointment in one of the most passionate football states in the union. But the year Donna changed the menus, the Bears not only won their division, they went on to win the state championship, beating the Peach County Trojans 28 to 14. <laughs> And Coach Parker, he credited that championship to Donna Martin. When we give our kids the basic nourishment, they're going to thrive. And it's not just up to the Cheryl Barbers and the Donna Martins of the world. It's on all of us. And feeding our kids the basic nutrition is just the starting point. What I've laid out is really a model for so many of the most pressing issues that we face. If we focus on the simple goal of properly nourishing ourselves, we could see a world that is more stable and secure. We could dramatically improve our economic productivity. We could transform our healthcare, and we could go a long way in ensuring that the Earth can provide for generations to come. Food is that place where our collective efforts can have the greatest impact. So we have to ask ourselves: What is the right question? What would happen if we? Fed ourselves more nutritious, more sustainably grown food. What would be the impact? Cheryl Barbara, Donna Martin, Coach Parker, and the Burke County Bears. I think they know the answer. Thank you guys so very much. <laughs>